Good morning, friends. My name is Joey Bates, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Orchard Oxford. So glad that you've decided to join us for worship today as we enter into God's presence and worship Him. I have a few things I want to let you know about going on in the life of our church. One is uh, a program we call Fusion. Uh, and In fact, I want you to watch this video about it. Are you engaged? Seriously dating and thinking about getting married? What about newly married for a year or less? Then allow me to introduce you to Fusion. Fusion is a virtual conference hosted by The Orchard designed to give engaged, seriously dating, and newly married couples a unique opportunity to learn about marriage in a fun, challenging, and authentic online environment. As a couple, you'll be sent multiple weeks of virtual content where you'll learn about a God-centered picture of marriage, about communication and conflict, in-laws, money, sex, and so much more. Fusion is about virtual content and also virtual community. So after watching the weekly teachings, you will be connected to an online small group led by a marriage mentor couple. You'll be connected with two to three other couples just like yourself who desire to gather together and to get the real picture of marriage from caring mentors who love each other and who deeply care about you as a couple. So how do you sign up for Fusion? Well, registration is super easy. All you have to do is click the link below. You'll answer a brief questionnaire. You'll pay the registration fee of $40, which includes access to all the videos and resources, and you're good to go. Fusion starts on Sunday, September the 27th, and ends with a live Q&A on Thursday, October the 15th. Friends, marriage is a huge decision. And here's the bottom line. Too many couples focus all of their energy on their wedding day and spend very little time or resources on the relationship itself. So, if you are seriously dating, engaged, or newly married, we want to help you start your relationship and your marriage on the right track. We hope you'll join us for Fusion. Fusion is a great program, and I invite you to be a part of it. The second thing I want to let you know about this morning is we are launching a new series called The Good Life. And with the launch of that series, we are relaunching our community groups as well. And community groups are able to meet online or in person this year, uh, depending upon your comfortability. And if you'd like more information uh, about our community groups, please email Alex Crosby, our discipleship pastor, at alex at theorchardoxford.net. And the third thing I want to let you know about this morning before we worship is that we actually started regathering in person this morning at 9 and 11 at our campus. Um, we are, we are uh, providing two services, 80 people at each service, and you can reserve your spot today by clicking the link below uh, in the comments. Um, please register. It helps us um, maintain a safe environment for the people coming to worship. If you would like that in-person gathering, we're going to continue to meet next week uh, in person at 9 and 11. If you're not comfortable meeting in person yet, Uh, feel free to continue to join us online here on YouTube or on Facebook Live at 9 o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's, uh, Let's worship together.
I believe there's something that we all hold in common. Every one of us wants a good life. I've never in my lifetime met somebody who said, I really want to screw up my life. I want it to be completely blown up. Every one of us wants to have a life that's fulfilling the good life. But here's the thing that I'm recognizing is that for many of us, we might not really understand what that looks like. For some, maybe the good life equates money. That the more money I make will equate that I actually have a higher level of happiness. But here's the irony. Studies show time and time again that really kind of happiness plateaus at a middle class income. And if it's not money, maybe it's we think I have to have that dream job, that opportunity. 
So for a big chunk of our lives, we'll hustle, we'll find ourselves in the grind, trying to impress people that we come to find out at the end of the day really don't care much about us at all. And if it's not maybe money or that dream job, maybe it's relationships. We believe the truth that relationships will bring some level of contentment. But at the end of the day, we get ourselves busy. We settle for a digitally connected life. In the long run, as well, studies have shown that kind of increases our level of depression or loneliness. Maybe this big idea known as the good life, if we were humbled enough, we would say, we don't even know what it exactly looks like or even how to get it. Friends, if you've ever wrestled with that question, and I know I have, welcome. My name's Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at the Orchard Oxford And I'm grateful that you've carved out space to hang out with us today. We do not take that lightly. So whether you join us for the first time or even the hundredth time, here's the thing. As we have something in common today, we all want to figure out what the good life is. We're going to go on that journey. Jesus, who came to this earth, he was God's son, had this very well-known famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. Essentially, he teaches on this mountainside located on the Sea of Galilee. And then the gospel writer Matthew writes chapters five through seven, He shares basically this sermon about what the good life looks like. But I'll give you this disclaimer. It may not look as you think the good life will look like. You're curious about what this good life looks like on God's terms. Let's dive in today. Today, we're going to be in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 3, the beginning of this sermon that Jesus gives. I'm going to read these few short verses, and we're just going to continue to dive right into it. That's what Matthew says at the start of this sermon on the mount. One day... As he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. What's the one thing that consumes all of your time, your thoughts? Maybe even you recognize this thing kind of comes out in the words that you share with others. For Jesus, he was consumed about one thing big thing. For us, maybe it's about sports or the weather or maybe a particular hobby or maybe it's our job that consumes all of our thoughts. But Jesus was 100% crystal clear. The thing that he was most devoted to, the thing that he talked about all the time was the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. You know, the crazy thing is when you look at the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Jesus only talks about the church only three times. 10 times that amount, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. And you even caught on to that here. Even at the end of verse three, it says the kingdom of God is theirs. If you were to look in this short section where these kind of blessed statements that Jesus gives us, even in verse 10, Jesus again repeats, for the kingdom of God is theirs. It's almost like in this short section, there's these bookends where Jesus says, here's a statement about the kingdom. Here's a statement about the kingdom. And if you want to know what it looks like, everything in between will give you evidence of what he felt this good life was all about. But here's the irony. The thing that consumed Jesus, we have great misunderstanding about. I don't know about you, in our 21st century Bible Belt Southern culture, when I say the words the kingdom of heaven, we oftentimes think future. We think about some glad morning for all of us who have been connected to Jesus, we believe in him, that we'll be reunited with him when we take our last breath. And truth be told, that's 100% accurate. But for Jesus, 90% of the time when he talked about the kingdom of heaven, he talked about it in the present tense. Consider verse 3, for the kingdom of God is theirs. I wonder if this crowd had the attention, like they're leaning in saying, wait a second, Jesus, you're telling me in this moment, in this place, alongside this mountain, that the kingdom of God can be mine here, now, and present. And Jesus was clear. Listen, I want you to know how basically the story of heaven can invade on earth your story right here, right now. And so Jesus begins to start repeating all these kind of blessed statements. He says, God blesses, and then he gives a statement. Maybe you read it uh, years before that blessed are those who kind of live this certain way. And again, we have this huge misunderstanding. When I say the words blessed, we can't help but think of maybe us in a very funny way saying hashtag blessed. I even had it this last week on a couple days ago. I went to the grocery store and my family's in the car and it's like the clouds parted. It's like I got that sweet parking spot. You know what I'm talking about? Like the one closest to the front doors and it's right beside the car corral. 
And I even joked with my wife, hey, look at this parking spot, hashtag blessed. We find ourselves doing that all the time. It's like, hey, my kid crushed it in this extracurricular activity, hashtag blessed. Hey, got to go to my favorite concert, hashtag blessed. My team won the big game, hashtag blessed. I just blazed past a police officer at 87 miles per hour and no blue lights, no red lights, nothing, hashtag blessed. We oftentimes associate that if we can get something or move forward in life, that that's where blessing lies. Here's the craziness. Our understanding of blessing and Jesus's, they're, they're pretty much in tune. Jesus, when he uses the word blessed, it just means a state of happiness or the good life. But how that plays out specifically may be completely different than we would ever envision. See, Jesus, when he talks about this here in Matthew 3, He's just walking in the, into the tradition that God has spoken all throughout the scriptures even before about what this good life, this happy life looks like. I think about Psalm 89. Happy are those, or that could even be translated, blessed are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. Let it be known with 100% clarity that the good life, the happy life, is when we choose to walk in a God-centered life, a life where God is at the centerpiece of it all. But that path, that understanding of blessing may look completely different than we think it should. You know, when Jesus starts out here in Matthew chapter five, and if we were just to center even in chapter five, not even get into chapter six or seven, the things that Jesus says, you might be saying to yourself, this Christian life, this thing of following after God, going after his path and walking in his light, it may seem virtually impossible. Consider these statements here from chapter five. If you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Ouch. I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus ends this chapter with a comment that, again, that seems virtually impossible. You are to be perfect, or what could be translated as whole, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I don't know about you, but when I read passages like this in verses, I can't but help but get this kind of like pitying feeling in my stomach. I mean, how's this first one going for you? In a political year where temperaments are hot and hostile, maybe you've seen something on social media, and whether, you, hopefully you didn't type it, but maybe you did, <laughs> or maybe you thought it in your head and said it out loud in your home, like, We've cursed somebody or put somebody down, and we're finding ourselves in kind of the fringes or the dangers of the fires of hell. What's your status on sexual purity? I know that's a very, uh, very personal question, but whatever your context is, single or married, obviously Jesus has some standard for that. Has anybody else figured out the algorithm of perfection? How we pray for our neighbors who actually persecute us? You know, here's the thing that I realize about the good life that maybe that pitying feeling that we have when we read something like this might be the, exactly the same spot that we need to be, that God desires for us to be in, that we might be closer to the kingdom of heaven than we would ever realize. As Jesus says this, the start of the good life happens when we acknowledge our need for God, that we recognize that as he says here in verse 3, Blessed are those who are poor and they realize their need for him. Friends, if Jesus came to you today and said, hey, do you want the kingdom of heaven? I know that many of us would say, yeah. And maybe this feeling of feeling inadequate in our weakness, in our brokenness is actually step one. Now, Jesus is clear. When he talks about blessed are the poor, he's not talking about money or monetary possessions here. He's not saying that the rich are cursed and the poor are blessed. What he's getting at, clearly evidenced here throughout the rest of chapter five, is that the playing field is level, that every one of us have to acknowledge that we feel spiritually bankrupt and poor because of one word that's present in your life and mine, and that word is sin. It's a word that we talk about in the church. It's a word that we don't really want to acknowledge, but our understanding of sin can be really placed this way. It's, it's simple in our understanding. Sin says that we think at times that we're a better king than Jesus could ever be in our lives, that we think that we have the ability to determine what the good life is and pursuing it, that we've traded the opportunity to have this king be in our lives and have him establish his kingdom 
in our place. You know, the word sin was originally an archery term. It's understood that way in the first century when Jesus wrote these words and long before that, that when an archer would go in a competition, they'd pull back that arrow and they would let it go. And when that arrow would go let go, if it missed the target, the judge would simply say these words, sin. There are moments in our lives broken where we acknowledge we have not hit the target. That God's design would be we'd be these archers who actually hit the target, that we would know the good life and we would experience the kingdom as Jesus desired it in our lives, and that others might actually see us hit that target and be interested. Who is Jesus? What is difference does he all make? But again, I've chosen at times to pull back that arrow and shoot at a target that gets me nowhere near the kingdom that Jesus has made available to me. We say this often at the orchard that sin always overpromises and it under delivers. But at some point, we have to acknowledge that the world and all of its busted up pro- pro- problems and programs and the things that we just look, we can see on the news that it's messed up, that the real issue at heart is ourselves. I think about a story from the late literary giant and theologian G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton was once asked by a newspaper, they said, what's, what's the biggest problem in the world? And Chesterton wrote back and he wrote this simple response in regards to the question, what's the greatest problem in the world? The answer is, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. At some point, if we're going to enter into the good life and experience the kingdom now, it requires us to admit at times we weren't anywhere near it in the first place. You know, this whole sermon series has been really kind of inspired by a book title called The Good Life, written by Derwin Gray. Derwin is a former NFL player and now a pastor in North Carolina. And Derwin had this breaking moment where he recognized his own spiritual bankruptcy, and he wrote these words in this book. He said, before God could heal me, he had to humble me. I had to see my spiritual poverty and let go of my perceived right to rule. You know what Derwin did in this moment? is really a reflection of how do we get this kingdom. Jesus actually gives evidence of how we would get this kingdom in the chapter before in Matthew 4. Again, Jesus is consumed by the kingdom of God. He wants everybody to see it clearly, for us to see it clearly, and to be able to experience it. And Jesus wrote these words in chapter 4. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. A few verses later, he said, Jesus traveled all throughout this same region, Galilee, announcing the good news of the gospel about the kingdom. How do we get to get to the point where we actually, blessed are the poor in spirit, we get the kingdom? We repent. Now, repentance is a fancy word we use in the church. Essentially what it means is we turn in the opposite direction. We acknowledge our sin, just like Derwin had that moment. And we turn in the opposite direction, and who do we turn to? We turn to God. For then the kingdom of heaven is near in that moment we recognize that we have no ability by our own strength and our own power to reverse our sin, our future death, and our present brokenness. We can get the kingdom, but it requires us to be humble and to repent. And this is incredible good news. You know, Jesus talked about the gospel or the good news. And again, it's another word we are familiar with. Maybe if you've heard it, I don't know what your story is, whether you are presently in the life of a church or you're following after Jesus or maybe not. But that's one of those buzzwords that we hear oftentimes in a Southern culture. But here's the thing. The word gospel in and of itself is misunderstood on plenty of occasions. When Jesus wrote these words, the word gospel in a first century was a military term. It was a military term essentially long before Jesus. The Greek empire, which was the leading empire of the day, long before Jesus, that what they would do is they would hire these what they called good news carriers or gospel carriers And they would roam all around kind of the Greek empire and they would go to town to town and they would tell people this update. Greece continues to win the battles that are in front of them, believe this good news and live accordingly. What Jesus does is he steps on the scene in the first century, presents in a compelling argument of what the good life looks like. And he says, I'm here to overcome the greatest battle of all time that bonds every human together. That is sin. Jesus did not roll into the Roman Empire of the day, said, I'm a new king, a new sheriff on the street here, and take over kind of these palaces that were all throughout Rome. No, rather, Jesus, in a humble, submissive way, went up a hill known as Calvary, 
that Jesus was the embodiment of Matthew 5, 48. He is the perfect one. And God requires this perfect sacrifice. So Jesus, the perfect one, takes on all of our sin so that we could be made right with God. And in that sacrifice, that yet they lay him down in the ground and his body was broken and busted up and bloody on a cross for us. Why? Because he loves us and desired for us to believe that good news and to live accordingly, to be free. Evidence that that sacrifice was successful is that three days later, death and sin don't win out, but rather resurrection does. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Sin does not win. And we poor in spirit, near to God's kingdom, acknowledge we need a savior because we cannot and have no ability to save ourselves. How do we get that? We repent and we turn to God. You know, Derwin had a moment in his story that you just read about. For me, I had a moment in my story. At the age of 14, I remember going on this church trip down to West Virginia uh, we went with some other people from our church to kind of help rebuild a couple homes in an area that had been wrecked by a dying coal mining industry. And I remember sitting on top of this roof. I can visualize it clear as day that I was with a couple other friends and one of my youth leaders. And I looked out around this whole neighborhood and it looked like a war zone. It was just homes in terrible condition. But as I got to know the story of the, of the very family that I was putting a roof on, friends, they had nothing by money or monetary standards but they were some of the most content people that I have ever met in my lifetime because they had Jesus. They were living a good life that out on the exterior, on the outside, it looked nothing of the such. I remember on a night of worship on that trip, somebody asked me some really hard questions. He said, who's gonna take account for your sins in this lifetime? Who are you gonna live for in this lifetime? And I, I didn't have an answer to that question. I put two and two together in a moment that I I can't really explain to you and to the best of my abilities, but it was supernatural in the sense that God, by the power of his spirit, I repented and said, I've not been living this life according to your design. And in that moment, when I repented and put my trust in Jesus, the good life began. Now, from that moment when I was 14, has it been like all awesome from that point forward? Well, surely not. You know, I think the good life, when it begins, and we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, We've got this picture now at times, time and time again, we recognize the brokenness that we find in ourselves, but take heart. Every broken moment is an invitation for us to walk in because blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of God can be theirs again and again and again. I'm mindful of the words of the great reformer, Martin Luther. He said, all of the Christian's life is one of repentance. Friends, once the good life begins, it can happen over and over again. We just are going to have numerous moments where we have to be honest about our own brokenness, but that's the key word. We have to be honest. I love the way that James, James is the half-brother of Jesus. Can't imagine that pressure. But James wrote these words to believers, not unbelievers, people who were followers of Jesus in the first century. James said, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We're gonna have these moments where we have to be honest and confess we're poor in spirit, we feel broken. But the process of that, of actually being alongside other people in relationships, that is the good life that can bring us contentment. We pray, we rally, we support, and God works his path of miraculous healing. I have some good friends that I have in my life, I learned a lot from their story. And part of their story is they're followers of Jesus, but part of their story is they have kind of a story of brokenness. They're part of an AA group or an NA group. And many of them would say step one, just like James would reveal, that step one in a 12-step program is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. I wonder today, exactly where you're at and where I'm at. Now, your struggle may not be alcohol, but where is it that you would be willing to admit that you have become powerless over that thing? What's in the blank? What's the thing that continues to on repeat in this season, and maybe it's been going on for a while, wreck you and wreak havoc, that it's the farthest thing from the good life? What I know is that at times we feel powerless over whatever is in the blank, 
that we serve a limitless God that wants to use everything at his disposal, us confessing, repenting, having his power, people around us, whether it's maybe we go to a counselor, I don't know what it is. God will use everything at his disposal, us to lean in and experience a God who has limitless power that continues to want to have the good life be implanted in and through us here and now. Friends, when I I look at these words today from Matthew 5, I know this to be true, that it's 100% expected that at times in our lives, maybe from the first time we followed Jesus or we've been following him for years, we're going to find ourselves in poor in spirit moments. That's expected, 100%. But what is 100% actually not acceptable is that we would go out of our way and we would hide from others about those moments, those broken, poor, in spirit moments that we're feeling. You know, my favorite line, probably in this whole passage, is actually even before Jesus says this blessed statement, he, he tells his disciples this. He says he sits down, his disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. It was a common posture to teach in the first century and long before that, the teachers or rabbis would sit. And I love that image, that in your brokenness right now, whatever's in the blank for you, that Jesus is not standing up, looking over you, down upon you, and scolding you, that rather Jesus is sitting right beside us, wanting to teach us what the good life looks like. And I wonder if Jesus was sitting beside me, even at this table or wherever you're at today, if he would lean in and ask you this question, where are you poor in spirit today? Would you answer that honestly? I think for every one of us, the thing we hold in common is we want the good life. And the thing that we also hold in common is that we're broken people. We're poor in spirit. And somewhere between our desire for the good life and our acknowledging our brokenness is that Jesus who's sitting beside us, he is Emmanuel, who is God, who is with us, saying, can we have an honest conversation? Where are you poor in spirit? Because the kingdom, the good life, can be yours. Some of you, maybe this is your defining moment of acknowledging your spiritual bankruptcy for the first time. Maybe it's like that moment for Derwin or my moment when I was on a, basically on a roof in the middle of West Virginia at the age of 14. And friends, if you're acknowledging your sin for the first time, just simply say, Jesus, I can't overcome my sin. I repent. I turn to you. I believe. And if you make that decision today, friends, we would love to like rejoice, celebrate, go out of our ways. When we see a life that's happening that moves to the good life, we need to rejoice. Make a comment down below. Share with us. We'd love to walk with you and figure out how we continue to faithfully walk into the good life together. Some of you, you've already started that good life. And you just find yourself in a rut today. Your life feels unmanageable. It feels broken. And take heart. God has managed a way to walk into your story, to experience the kingdom of heaven now. Again and again, repent and trust in Jesus. Friends, are you poor in spirit? Take heart. The kingdom of heaven, the good life, can be yours. Trust in Jesus. Holy Spirit, we're thankful for your word your word which leads us to your son, your son who came to overcome the greatest battle, our own sin and brokenness, our moments where we feel poor in spirit. And would you now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to every one of us exactly where we're at, that we might be honest, that we might confess, that we might be real, and that you might heal is what your promise is to be. Work now, for we desire to walk into the good life which you have entrusted to us. In your name we pray. Friends, we now come to the time of our response. We'd urge you, sing with us. Maybe this is a moment where you don't want to sing and you just want to sit there. and Just visualize at times Jesus is right beside you saying, be honest about the poor and spirit moment in your life. Trust that he's there beginning to work, drawing you to his kingdom and to the good life. Be honest with wherever you're at. Trust that God is working and writing a better story. Please sing, please respond. Dog.
And as always, this is a time for those of us who call this place our home. If you're a guest with us today, or if you're tuning in for the first time, or you've been tuning in throughout this entire season, we actually ask that you not give unless you feel moved or prompted to do so. And if you're the, a member of another community of faith, we actually invite you to continue to give to them uh, as well so that their needs are met during this time. But if you call the Orchard Ox for your home, if this is your community of faith, this time is for you. And you can give in a variety of different ways. You can give through our app, uh, you can give online at theorchard.net slash give, you can mail us a check, or you can text a donation uh, to the number that you see on the screen. Um, as we make those offerings at, during this time of worship, uh, let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the offering of Jesus, and it's in response to, to your gift of your son that we offer these gifts back to you. God, we recognize that all we have is yours, and that you've blessed us with it. And so, God, we give it back to you, uh, asking you uh, to, to use it for how you see fit. God, will you use these gifts and bless them and multiply them to spread your kingdom throughout this world? Um, because, God, we are after your will and your will alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get going today, I want to remind you that you can register for our in-person gathering next week at 9 and 11. And we also are offering Orchard at Home if you want a, a, a group of community, a community group to meet um, and also worship. You can worship at home at your house, and we provide that information. 
or you feel free to join us online next week at 9 o'clock as well. Thank you so much for being here today. Look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great week.